All right. Fancy here. So uh, thank you guys all for joining this call about sleep, the importance of sleep, why in fact uh, physically with the body is it important to sleep. I want to talk about some of the challenges we have and some possible solutions. At the end of this presentation, it's really going to be open up to just go back and forth with some challenges folks have on the call with sleep and some potential solutions they have or things that they've experienced in the past that they have felt were solutions to help, in fact, help them to get sleep for help and supporting of themselves. So some statistics regarding sleep. Did you know that sleep in America in the 1960s and the 1970s, the average American slept eight to eight and a half hours of sleep. But today, just 50 years later, we average less than seven hours of sleep. It's like six hours and 53 minutes on average for the average American. So we are in fact sleep deprived. We do require anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep as human beings to get sufficient enough sleep. The percentage of Americans who do not get enough sleep is almost 40%. So we're looking at about, in America, about, a, about 100 million people. And a couple of startling statistics regarding daylight savings time. When it starts in the spring and we spring forward, obviously we lose an hour. And typically, since it's overnight, we lose an hour of sleep, typically. Did you know that in America, every single year, when we spring ahead one hour, the number of fatal car accidents in America increased by 6% that next week. Wow. In fact, in the fall, when we go back in time and we save an extra hour and we get an extra hour of sleep, fatal car accidents actually go down that next week by 6%. Wow. Yeah, so just that one hour alone, obviously, when you talk about 300 million people, can really affect what's going on. Uh, the same thing, and I'll get a little bit more in physiology with regards to the heart and cardiovascular system, but the same thing can be said for heart attacks. We all know that the number one day of the week, everybody has a heart attack, is primarily on Mondays. But the Monday after we lose that sleep in the spring, the Monday after that, heart attacks go up on that Monday by 24% compared to other Mondays. Wow. And in the fall, when we lose, we gain that extra hour of sleep because we, we go back on clocks, we uh, heart attacks on that Monday go down by 21%. So I just ask you to think about and extrapolate just one hour difference of sleep and what impact that has made, obviously on a lot of individuals, but what that potentially could do for yourself. Right. Um, it's not switching. Hang on. There we go. All right. So, so the first thing when I think about, especially before I put this presentation together or some of the stuff that I've accumulated knowledge with regards to lifestyle medicine, this is really just about being tired in the morning. And some people say, well, in fact, there was a song written, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? This is just about being tired in the morning, right? And it's actually, unfortunately, a heck of a lot more than just being tired in the morning. Obviously, that is one of the problems that we have when we don't get enough sleep. We're exhausted, we lack an energy, we lack in focus. But there's many chronic conditions such as heart failure, we talked about heart attacks, high blood pressure, diabetes, and stroke that are actually now proven, evidence-based proven, that if you go sleep deprived for a long period of time, could be a week, could be a month, your, actually your body has more propensity to chronic diseases. In, in purple on your screen, notably insufficient sleep has been linked to development of management of a number of chronic diseases and conditions, including type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and depression. I'm gonna talk about some of those specifically in just a moment, but I just wanna to explain to you what happens to your body when you sleep over the course of the night. 
you go through what's called a sleep cycle. And typically you're gonna go through four to five sleep cycles a night. And this is a, on your screen, you can see there's eight hours of sleep on this particular average um, graphic design here that you see on your screen. And where those curves dip is one cycle. The second cycle is around three hours. The, the, the third cycle is around five hours. And what I wanna share with you, and we'll see this on a future slide, that the later cycles of sleep, which is like your fourth, fifth, and sixth cycle, if you can get enough sleep, is when the most repair happens to the brain. You'll hear a lot in this presentation that there's a lot of repair that's going on to the different organs of the body, the tissues in the body, and obviously most importantly, the cardiovascular system, i.e. the heart and the brain. So if you are not getting enough sleep because you're somebody that I'm just, I'm always on the go and I'm only gonna get five to five and a half hours of sleep, maybe six hours on a good night, you're not even giving your body enough sleep cycles to go through the repair process for your brain. And this kind of talks a little bit about it. This is just an image on your right-hand side where it goes through that, where you're awake and you go through REM sleep, which is typically when you're having more vivid dreams, although you can dream in the non-REM which stands for rapid eye movement, stage one, stage two, stage three. And then on the left-hand side, it tells you what is happening to your body as you go through these various cycles. And just know the most important thing is that you get good quantity of sleep, i.e. enough, and you get good quality of sleep where you're not interrupted or waking up and, and you know, having a problem with getting really good deep sleep. Again, brain repair stage four is an even deeper level of sleep where the brain weighs further slow and sleepers are, are very difficult to wake. It's believed that tissue repair occurs during this stage of sleep and that hormones are released to help with growth. So that's the brain. We also talk a little bit about diabetes. The lack of sleep causes less insulin to be released in your body after you eat while your body secretes more stress hormones which helps you to stay awake, but insulin cannot do its job effectively. Too much glucose stays in the bloodstream, which increases your risk of type two diabetes. High blood pressure, which then of course could lead to strokes. During normal sleep, your blood pressure goes down. Having sleep problems means your blood pressure stays higher for longer periods of time. High blood pressure is one of the leading risks for heart disease and stroke, about 75 million Americans, about one in three, have high blood pressure. So very important to take care of yourself in respect to sleep. And then of course, heart health. Substantive evidence demonstrates that sleeping problems, including sleep deprivation and fragmented sleep have a negative effect on the heart health. As I shared with you statistic with heart attacks right after we lose that hour of sleep. Sleep is an essential time for the body to recuperate. During non-rapid eye movements, non-REM sleep stages, heart rate slows, blood pressure drops, and breathing stabilizes. These changes reduce the stress of the heart, allowing it to recover from strain, that, that which occurs during the waking hours. Without sufficiently getting enough sleep at night, a person doesn't spend enough time in these deep stages of non-REM sleep that benefit the heart. The same problem can affect people whose sleep is frequently interrupted. As a result, chronic sleep deprivation has been linked to numerous heart problems, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart attack, obesity, diabetes, and stroke. Does anybody recognize this image on your screen? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Can you guys see who that is? No, I can't tell who it is. I don't know who it is, but I see. Good. Sleepless in Seattle. That's right. So this, <laughs> is, this is the scene where the two ladies are talking about, I think a night to remember or whatever it is, a affair to remember, and they just start crying. <laughs> and the little boy looks at him and, and goes, are you okay? So uh, emotions. So uh, this is, this is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So anxiety, one of the sleepless nights that you have can elevate your stress level by 30%, which you could be anxious, which is why you're not getting sleep, which is then causing in that much difficulty to get sleep. So it's a, it's a, a cyclical process that makes it that much more difficult. But I think we're all aware that when we do not get enough sleep, 
in general, I know myself, especially I struggle with my emotions. I used to be an overnight pharmacist and I would work, you know, basically the night shift. And I do address that a little bit on this presentation as well. And uh, I'm Catholic and I would go to mass on Sunday mornings, sometimes by myself. And I would be sing singing right after I worked the night shift and I would just start crying. And I was like, oh my God, why am I crying? <laughs> so emotions are also something that need to be probably regulated more readily. And if you get sleep deprived, it becomes that much more difficult to do so. So the challenges with sleep, and these are, some of these are just kind of off the top of my head, but I think you probably can relate to this. So I would like to hear from you. My first bullet of challenges with, with sleep are distractions, right? So what are some distractions that could interfere with somebody trying to sleep? And this could be any number of things. What do you guys think? Cell phone. How so? Uh, well, my mistake is I always have it by me. So, okay. Um, so there's like all these alerts, social sure. media, stuff like that. So I think you and I have talked about that in the past about, I just need to get rid of the damn thing and put it away. So, sure. you know, I don't get caught up, uh, yeah. you know, with the kids or whatever's going on. And, but that's definitely my bad habit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does self get restless, you by your side is a, is a great example of a distraction. Okay, what, what else comes to mind? Well, along with what Bev just said, the phone, I mean, because there's distractions of games, you know, oh, I got to okay. play this game or yeah. um, somebody texts me sometimes at two or three in the morning that's mm -hmm. awake, yeah. you know, um, so those are all um, definite issues. Also, mm -hmm. the having the TV on okay. is not probably the best way to <laughs> even take a nap or whatever. Okay. Yeah, having the TV on being a distraction. Okay. What other distractions can you guys think of? Having a dog that sleeps with you and decides that she yeah. wants to get up and she climbs yeah. over you or barks at you or, yeah. you know, scratches at your, yeah. So that's a, yeah. a distraction. <laughs> great, great example. Anything else? My husband would say when your wife is sleeping so deeply that she's breathing loudly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The spouse that breathes loudly when he or she sleeps, okay? <laughs> I have a solution for that, which we'll talk about in a future slide here. Anything um, else? Noises on the yeah. roof, like squirrels running around on okay. the roof. Okay, yeah, definitely. I was, uh, I spent many years on call at night. And so you sleep, sleep, you sleep with one ear open, as it were. Yeah. And uh, that, tra that trained me to, to do it but then when i stopped being on call which is actually fairly recently in my career mm -hmm. it was hard for me to turn that off yeah definitely you yeah. know one thing that was good or that i think is good with the snow days when they call school early like the day before like they did this time because right. i when i was teaching i remember i would be awake till two or three in the morning are we gonna have a snow day you know right. absolutely and they wouldn't tell us until 6.30 or something, right. you know, so. Definitely. Okay, so those are some great examples of distractions. So I put in here overnight shifts, not only because I have experienced this with overnight shifts, but also many people on this call or maybe watching the video, your circadian rhythms have been disrupted, obviously. So, so you know, we as humans, let's say, have been around the way we are today for about 200,000 years, right? Just ballpark. We've been around for probably a couple million years, but the humanoids that we are today, we've been around for about 200,000 years. But in the last 200,000 years, when have we been awakened in the middle of the night because we have a light bulb or a television, right? So it's been recent, right? So really just in the last couple of 100 years, so just 200 years, our bodies are not attuned with the shifts in the lighting. So what used to happen is as the sun went up and the sun went down, when the sun went down, people got rested and they went to sleep and they slept just fine and they woke up when the sun came up. 
now, obviously, with our incredibly busy, distracted lives and the, the light bulb, which is wonderful, it really throws off our circadian rhythms that actually physically and chemically within the body adjust to where and how we need to be sleeping. Okay, so that's another challenge with sleep. And then I put blue light on there and, and a number of you have talked about the cell phone as a distraction because there's games or as a distraction because it chirps in the middle of the night or buzzes or does whatever at the middle of the night. But also it emits blue light, which stimulates the melatonin to not be released in the body, which when melatonin is released because it thinks it's sunlight, right? That blue light has the same wavelength as a lot of the sunlight. So you're telling your body that you're supposed to be awake when you're looking directly into your cell phone or even your television with these new, new flat screen TVs as well. Those are also challenges with trying to get enough sufficient sleep. So some sleep improvement suggestions, and there are a ton. I just put three on here. These aren't necessarily the end all and be all, but I did want to put some stuff on here. And then after this, we can just kind of facilitate where we are ourselves with sleep, whether that's challenges or solutions. So the first, first suggestion that I have is to use your bed for sleep and sex or and or sex only, right? So don't use it for reading, don't use it for television watching, um, don't use it because you have all your work at home and you wanna bring it you know, at work and you wanna bring it home and just lay it all out on your bed. And the reason for this is because when you use your bed for sleep only, your brain and your body associate your bed with sleep. So you, when, you, when you get into bed, you fall asleep faster, you sleep longer, and your quality of sleep is better, right? So if you can possibly not watch TV in your bed, from your bed, if you can possibly not read a book in your bed or do your work, your, your homework, you know, from work, that could potentially help you a great deal. Really limit that to just using it for sleep. Number two, establish a hard boundary for when you're going to go to bed at night. And this is something that I have coached clients with for quite some time. You know, when I coach clients, it's a lot about plants and it's a lot about movement. And some clients are like, I'm really struggling with my sleep because I don't make good decisions when I don't get enough sleep, right? One solution potentially for those individuals that let's say every day I get up at 6 a.m., you set a hard boundary for just in this example, eight hours before you're going to, you are physically going to be in bed by 10 p.m. That's kind of your own hard boundary for making sure. You, and that doesn't mean you start getting ready for bed at 10 p.m. That doesn't mean you start brushing your teeth and finally get to bed by 10 30, 10 45. That means you do all that stuff. So by the time you're physically in bed, you've hit your deadline at 10 p.m. And having that hard boundary doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It just means that the chances of you being in bed sooner and getting quicker sleep is that much better. So just ha having that as a rule for yourself is a potential solution. And the last one could possibly help with some of the things we talked about as far as distractions, the squirrel on the roof, the spouse that breathes too hard or heavy or loud or what have you, various distracting noises from the phone is the function of white noise. And this is something that was introduced to me when I started going to college and we, lit, we slept in a cold dorm or a warm dorm and there were fans going all the time. Now you, you're not gonna hear anything but that fan so it really blocks out the noise. And the issue with noise at night is is the change in the noise, right? So if it's really quiet and obviously there's a loud noise, it wakes you up, but the alternative happens as well. If you're, you know, you sleep with your windows open and you're by a busy street and it's making a lot of noise, that's white noise and it drowns everything out. But then if somebody comes and closes that and it gets quiet, the change in noise can wake you up as well. So what white noise does, and there's many apps that you can use that has the white noise apps, or you can have, we had a fan in our bedroom for years and now we use the app. That was the compromise my wife and I have that we still can have the white noise, but it has a constant stream of the same sound. It could be a fan. It could be just, it could be literally white noise, like a TV set at night back in the seventies when it used to have that noise, et cetera. So those are just some suggestions 
I'd like to open it up before we go to the next round, which is really just discussion of this for what suggestions that you guys can think about that relates to how we can improve our sleep. What makes sense to you guys? Well, there have been times that melatonin has helped. Okay. Um, although that's probably not the best way to go. It's probably better to um, just do all the things that you said. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, which is also a, a chemical intervention, uh, my husband has had a horrible, horrible, horrible case of shingles these mm. last two months. Yeah. And the relief that he has gotten this the first time in his life is uh, marijuana gummies. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Which I, again, it's not the best way to go, I don't think, but. Sure. Well, that ha that's probably helping with pain and sleep and everything there, so. Well, and that's part of it because it deals with the pain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, what else comes to mind as far as uh, sleep improvement suggestions? We really like using the white noise. We have a noise machine that just does white noise like the old TVs. Um, we even bought one for when we're traveling because okay. we find that when we're in a hotel or whatever, it's not in our normal yeah. place. We don't sleep as well because we hear things we don't normally hear, so. There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, a really dark, dark room. Okay. Yeah. For one thing, I have room darkening shades in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And um, they say to sleep when it's just as totally black darkness as you can get. And I try at least. Mm -hmm. And there is a hallway light on in the bathroom there, but otherwise. And sometimes I'll drink some chamomile tea mm -hmm. or we a little grocery store's got a jug of uh, tart cherry juice concentrate. And sometimes I'll drink that if I'm really feeling, you know, like I, I want to get extra good night's sleep or whatever, chamomile yeah. tea or the tart cherry juice. Yeah, that's great. What else comes to mind? Uh, for me, I can't. I don't sleep well if I'm too hot. So, I mean, we have a ceiling fan, but mm -hmm. I also try to remember, I literally turn down the heat mm -hmm. before I go to bed. And I'm usually the last one that goes to bed. Yeah. Um, and then I turn up the heat again in the morning, but yeah. I just, it, you know, the way our house is, if the heat's on, our room is just too hot. And I, I can't, I, it's mm -hmm. always been a problem. I can't sleep when I'm hot. Mm -hmm. But if, if the room is like a little chilly, you know, I can pull, you know, the comforter up around me. I'm, I'm much more comfortable. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You, know, you typically should sleep in a cooler environment because your body, um, I think your core gets warmer, but just in general, your environment should typically be cooler. And then you have the flexibility of pulling on your covers or, or putting them off right. versus when you're hot, then you're pretty much stuck. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything else? I come had to mind? laugh when I had to laugh when I saw the thing about how your body temperature drops because I yeah. feel like I am so cold. John is is the hot person. Mm -hmm. I'm always so cold, mm -hmm. and it's it's an issue, you know, between us. And so <laughs> yeah. So when I saw that your body temperature drops, I thought, well, geez, I must go into cryo freeze or something <laughs> because I'm always so cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mike mike when um uh and, and by the way claire i prefer a cold room so you can just imagine how it works at my house <laughs> we have these alternative thermostats and and you know if i because we live in an old house and the problem is you know it would be great if we could just leave the doors open but i can't do that because i have a cat who will come and fall my face at 5 a.m on the button <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if I don't keep him out. But anyway, Mike, when, when do you want to discuss sleep apnea? Uh, here or later? Uh, later would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Definitely. Good, good point. Any other suggestions? I've got a couple that I thought about when you guys were talking and I want to bring those up, but I want to just offer it uh, uh, just one more time as far as thoughts of things that you can think about that maybe you've recognized that help you with sleep or you've heard about that potentially could help with sleep. 
Well, one thing that has definitely sometimes helped me with sleep and it makes me feel guilty is I'll try to, I'll start saying a prayer. And as soon as I start saying a prayer, it's like, I'm out, okay. you know? Okay. So, and I asked my minister about that because I figured, oh my gosh, this might not be, you know, mm -hmm. This might be blasphemy, but my minister assured me that that was probably a wonderful thing. Yeah. Oh, no, Bev, not at all. We use the road. We Catholics use the rosary. We can't get, even get a, a decade in. But my shoes are down. <laughs> so no worries. No worries. Um, well, I like this suggestion. I think the other Beverly mentioned uh, just getting the phone away from yeah. me. Uh -huh. yeah, you know, having it charging like, you know, at least somewhere where I would have to make a really big effort to get to it. I, right. I, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, definitely. Something that I thought about was, you know, again, all these things kind of tie together when you're moving and you're moving more. In other words, you're having an active lifestyle. You're living a vibrant life. If you're in some form or fashion, whether that's a walk or exercising, that's really helpful for getting better sleep at night. However, it probably shouldn't be, depending on the person, but it typically shouldn't be within the first, for within a couple of hours from you going to bed, because typically you're more alert and it wakes you up. Uh, not necessarily 100%. I definitely have worked out, jumped in the shower, and then gone to bed. But exercise in general is such a powerful, supportive lifestyle to help you to be more healthy, but it also augments your sleep. And then something that most of us probably on this call do is we drink coffee. And I didn't wanna forget to mention that, you know, when you're tired and you're sleepy in the middle of the afternoon, if you can try to take a nap, it can even be 10 or 15 minutes versus grabbing a cup of coffee because the half hour of caffeine, the half-life of caffeine is five hours. So at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, you still got 25% of that caffeine in your body. And even though you may have felt rested and you're gonna be fine, et cetera, remember there's a lot more going on than just how you're feeling as far as being rested. So potentially have a hard fast rule for coffee. For me, it's noon. By the time I get to noon, if I haven't had my typical one or two cups of coffee, I don't have any more the rest of the day. So just be leery on that. So, uh, John, you want to kick us off with the challenges portion of sleep. How is your sleep? So I'd like to talk success and challenges here, and then I'm going to stop share. I like the little kitty there. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, so, so I'm a home health nurse, and I'm also a person with uh, diagnosed sleep apnea. And uh, so, so I, it's a both and proposition for me. So, so many times in my practice, um, I would, I don't know, must be a ghost. That's um, I would talk to people that had sleep apnea and it was amazing how many of those machines were dust covered and dirty. They just weren't being used. Very, very common piece of non-compliance. And early in my career, when I was a hospice nurse, uh, it was a real powerful example of a circumstance where I had an 80 plus year old woman who was told by the director of the congestive heart failure clinic at Furry Heart that if she did not become compliant with her CPAP, he was going to refer her to hospice home care. Oh, wow. I mean, literally, you know, you don't get moving on this. You know, the stress on your heart will basically make you eligible by prognosis criteria, I mean, you know, meaning weeks to months to live. And that scared her <laughs> into compliance with her CPAP. And she happened to be my patient the whole time. And she lived another two and a half years. I mean, you know, I, let me say this. She was like 86 or seven when he gave her that. And she lived past 90, I believe, okay. uh, with compliance. So she had a, an ancient heart to begin with, but it really made that much of a difference. Yeah. And then when I was in my... 40s, I worked in ICU. And so I'm middle aged, I got five kids, and they're asking me to work 12 hour nights, you know, which again, the 12 hour shift has been a real killer for middle aged nurses. Let me tell you, it's been a war. Sure. Because it's yeah. never 12 hours, you have to go a half an hour early, you know, or more, you're going to stay at least an hour to two hours late, especially if you've had a bad night. So 
and you know so guess what i was doing you know i was smoking and mm -hmm. drinking coffee sure you know sure. to just kind of stay in the game right and that's when my sleep apnea was diagnosed and um and then i had to uh be my own patient right you know and really uh go through that adjustment period to be compliant mm -hmm. but what i will tell anybody who you know has resisted getting a sleep study or if you've been diagnosed, you know, being compliant, the technology has improved so much. I mean, the headset that I use now is super lightweight, comfortable. I can read with it on. I know we talked about it. I probably shouldn't be, but I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, and I don't feel like Darth Vader when I go to sleep, you know, which is pretty nice because uh, there was a body image concern I had early on. So, um, and then just a quick anecdotal story. I had an offer, uh, oh, maybe seven years ago to go to Canada to fish mm -hmm. and we were going to go to a fly-in trip which means that you know you're going to get into one of those planes with the pontoons and you're going to fly to some destination that doesn't have electricity okay. and I'm like oh I want to go so badly but the guy that invited me to go who ironically was a respiratory therapist <laughs> wow. I said I said Joe I said you know, here's the problem. We're going to be, you know, out there in this cabin, which I think had propane uh, for hot water and maybe a little bit of solar. But I said, there's no way I can go a week without my CPAP. I've become that. It makes that much of a difference in me getting good sleep. So, and here he got this big grin on his face. He says, because I was the youngest of the guys going. He says, listen, he says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. The three other guys that are going, we all wear CPAPs. We're going to bring a gas generator. So here we were in the middle of nowhere, wolves howling, you know, in the distance. Yeah. And we were all just tucked in with our little CPAPs on in the middle of the, you know, Canadian yeah. wilderness. That's so awesome. there, if there's a will, there's a way Definitely. to be compliant with even, you know, advanced sleep apnea. And it's made such a difference for me. That's no awesome. Yeah. I, I was not familiar with the compliance level like you're stating. I, I have had obviously clients that have had it and have been using it and really want to use it because it helps them feel so much better in the morning because of the oxygen and the sleep, et cetera. But I wasn't aware that that's a, that was the, an issue. The hardest, the hardest time is the first three weeks because you have to, it is an adjustment. There's no yeah. question. It's a big adjustment. Sure. But what people do is they just won't get through. They'll say, it makes me feel claustrophobic or I just can't handle it, but they'll try for a night or two. Gotcha. And it's just, you know, just such a shame because it makes such a huge difference. Yeah, I have heard that. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Sure. Mm -hmm. This is his four o'clock alarm right here. <laughs> yeah, his name is Louie. Yeah, Hello. keep the door shut. We got to get our sleep. <laughs> oh. Who else either has a success or a challenge as it relates to sleep that they'd like to share with the group? I think just having a spouse that gets up earlier than you as well. Um, I know he's not out here banging pots and pans, but I hear everything he's doing. You know, when he's coming in and out of the bathroom or something like that to get ready for work and he has to be at work at, you know, 6.30, whatever. Right. Um, I'm not quite ready to wake up. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we have, we have the same challenge here. I, I get up before she does, although she gets up pretty early, but I'm, she says, I still hear you. <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah. Anyway. So I have to tell myself, don't go to bed too late because you know you're going to woke up early. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. You know, I got in the habit of, I, I think I'm just kind of naturally more of a night owl, but when, like John said, you know, he had five kids and the only time I could ever get anything done and really be able to stick with it and feel like I was getting it done, done, you know, was mm -hmm. when everybody was asleep. Yeah. So it was nothing for me to stay up till like three o'clock in the morning just to, because that made me feel good to know I finally did whatever it was that I thought was so important that I had to do that. So, yeah. and, and I can drink coffee all day long. I even have it at the bedside sometimes, you know, and I'm reading, oh. I'm drinking coffee. I mean, I'm like, this is not good for, you know, you guys to follow my example because I'm doing everything wrong and I can go right to sleep. Can you? Well, but here's the thing. So, you know, again, 
healthcare between, you know, schedules and being on call and everything else. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, we train our, our bodies with stimulants really right. early in our career. You're a pharmacist. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, no. So, so this thing about coffee, sometimes I wonder if the way that we drink coffee deep into the evening is a, is a mythology that we just continue to buy into, mm -hmm. but it really is affecting the depth of our sleep. I think that it is. Yeah, I think it really is. Certainly at my age, it is. Now, I just read an article. I don't remember what the source was, but they said that they're finding that um, if you drink coffee, a little bit of coffee before you take like an afternoon nap, that it allows you to, because it takes about 30 minutes or something, I guess, for it to actually get right. circulated. And so by that time, you're ready to wake up because mm -hmm. you're just taking a 20, 30 minute nap. And so you feel more awake because the coffee has kicked in. So I don't know. There's different ways to, yeah. to look at it. But I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I have heard that as well. Oh, have you? Okay. I have because it, it does take a while for it to kick in about 20 to 30 minutes. By that time you've now slept, you feel refreshed, and the coffee kicks in at the same time. So yeah, very cool. Anything else I'm coming? I'm not a napper. On? You're not a napper. I'm such a napper. I, I, I try, and it, it takes me that long to finally start feeling a little bit sleepy. Mm -hmm. It just, I don't know. I can't do it very well. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big time. I think I could probably win at least a silver medal in the Olympics in napping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a gold medalist, but uh, I, I well, literally yeah. have it down to a science where I can literally put my head down, sleep for 10 minutes, wake up and go, wow, I feel great. Or two hours. You get that. Yeah, it's great. I but love it. th that's the question then. How long is considered a decent nap? I mean, because my naps can be easily two hours. Yeah. Your, your nap should not be three hours before you go to bed, right? So that's yeah, one yeah. of the distinctions right there. And it's really whatever makes sense for your body. But if it's too, if you have a problem sleeping that night because you took a tower nap, you probably slept too long. But uh, if it's if it's in the evening, like if I I know if it's around 5 30, 6 o'clock, I, I can't lay down because then I really won't sleep very well at night. And that's how it, that's how you kind of measure what's too long or what's short enough or what have you. So but sometimes I just literally go to bed two o'clock in the afternoon, tell Gray Sand, hey, I'm just gonna lay down for a few minutes. And 15 minutes later, I felt like I slept for an hour. And she's like, did you, you didn't sleep, huh? And I'm like, oh, I actually slept really well, but it's only for like 10 minutes, so. It's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Anything else with regards to sleep in general? Mike, are you familiar with binaural beats? Uh, and does that really matter? Is white any white noise sufficient, or is that frequency stuff that you can get online? Because a lot of times they say, you know, it needs to be done with headphones or earbuds, and I'm like, well, now you've got something stuffed in your ears all night, which isn't necessarily the, I think, the smartest or safest thing. I worry about, um, you know, vertigo and some of the things that might be happening to ears. You know, just like all the things that are happening to eyes with all the stimulation and computer work that we're doing. I'm worried about ears now, too, with right. all the earbud use. Uh, I honestly don't know. When I, I've gone to a Catholic Heart work camp and I've used, because there was so much snoring in the room with the other sponsors that were there, I've used earbuds <laughs> and it's worked okay for me for a few hours. But I, I move around when I sleep. So when that earbud hits the pillow, then it kind of alerts me and wakes me up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, the, 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 only, the only thing that I've studied as far as the white noise is just the consistency of the noise. Mm -hmm. Like I said, okay. if there's a change, then either to the quiet or to the noise, to the noisier, the, the inflection of that is what alerts you to wake you up. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, I lock the doors. I mean, I, it's a very dark room. And so some people are like, oh, I want to make sure I hear every little crick in the night. And I'm just like, if somebody's robbed my house, I just let me sleep. I'll just find out <laughs> in the morning. So... And I had to consciously make a decision to take my phone and put it in the other room uh, because our kiddos, and we always want to be accessible to them. We have them set up on our phones to only receive texts from the three kids. Uh, and then sometimes Beverly on the call, if there's an issue with mom, but 
that's it, you know? So she'll have a group text with all her girlfriends and at 3 a.m., they're all chiming back and forth. So <laughs> we finally figured out how to set the phone up so we couldn't receive any of those dings or anything, unless it's from the kids. And then we told the kids, hey, if unless it's an emergency, let mom and dad get some sleep. We had to have that conversation a few times with some of them uh, because, you know, with the best of intentions, they get sidetracked or distracted. But apparently they wanted to wish mom happy birthday yesterday at 6 a.m., which is fine. <laughs> So, but, uh, but yeah. Something else that might be helpful for some people is not to drink much before you go to bed because when you get up to go to the bathroom, yeah, thank you for saying that. Night, you know, you're point. disrupting your sleep. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely. Same thing with taking, you know, your diuretic typically in the morning versus the afternoon or the evening. So you're not getting up, go to the restroom. And I have clients that they want to push a half a gallon or a gallon of water, but their goal is by 4 p.m. to have that done for that reason. So they're not getting up, you know, two or three times at night uh, to get rid of that. So very good, good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Something else too, I, I am awakened by sometimes by super aggressive leg cramps. Mm. So um, I... I try to uh, take magnesium um, mm -hmm. and sometimes tonic water helps, but I mean, it's, it's not all the time. It's just every once in a while. And boy, it just, I literally have to uh, use the hairdryer or, or get in the shower and let hot water run on my, I mean, it's that bad at some time. So. Is it like a Charlie horse that just starts cramping up or? Oh yeah. It's Is it really your hamstrings, your? Your thighs, um, your calves. Yes. Calves. Yeah. Well, it's my it. It can be my quads. It can oh, be. Oh, you have. Okay. Yeah, anything below the waist. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wonder what a heating pad helped that. Oh, I sleep with a heating pad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. She'd sleep with a wood burning stove if she could. Get <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Very cool. Yeah, Rose, I could not be your roommate. <laughs> I know, I know. Now, something else I think is related, and you know this about me, Mike, you know, I, it's a challenge for me to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a key thing for me. Uh, if I don't stay hydrated enough, yeah, then I think chances are that probably correlates with that too. Especially since point. I'm such a big coffee drinker too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, I agree, Rose. I um, and I think the older I get, the more easily I dehydrate. Um, <clears throat> so, I uh, you know, it, it's kind of a fine line you have to walk. But I do the same thing. I eat a bunch of bananas. Well, clearly, like a million banana smashed egg um, cookies lately, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> um you know, I, you know, I, I have potassium. I sometimes take if I start to get leg cramps, <clears throat> but I also, especially in the last year, noticed there have been times where I've actually felt kind of like lightheaded or whatever. And literally I'm dehydrated. And if I drink a oh. bottle of water real quick, I'm fine. So, yeah. wow. I, you know, I agree. I think that that's probably part of it. Yeah. Very good point. Very good suggestions. I drink, I drink dill pickle juice when I get leg cramps. Okay. I used to get so bad for some reason when I worked at the uh, greenhouse. I guess because I sweat it all day and I will run a lot, run around a lot. And mm -hmm. I get leg cramps or sometimes when I exercise and do Zumba in the evenings in addition to working all day and get uh, cramps and things. So. Susan, did you say pickle juice? Yeah. Pickle juice. Does it need to be dill or sweet? Dill. Dill pickle juice. Right. I don't know why, but... <laughs> as long as it works. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, the, the sodium probably helps you retain the water, you know, maybe. Exactly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If it's a brine. But I read that. I found that online because I was having problems with that almost every week. Mm-hmm. 
you know, when I was I was well hydrated, but I think I just flushed my electrolytes out or something. I did something. I don't know. Huh. Isn't it interesting how Gatorade has become this monster uh, presence, you know, through oh, yeah. virtue of advertising and the stuff is loaded with sugar. Oh, my gosh. It, it's amazing. amazing that it's sold as a health drink. Just oh, yeah. crazy to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm going to close it out, but I, I just want to finish by saying thank you guys so much. Some great conversation. I hope that the presentation was beneficial. Just if, if anything, just informative as it relates to, I don't get enough sleep and this is potentially what it could be causing in my body. That was my big aha moment in putting this together. I actually presented at Toastmasters a couple of weeks ago and was gathering data and information and presented actually for whatever reason, my phone didn't record the, the presentation the first 30 seconds and then it cut out. But by putting that together for Toastmasters and putting that together for the folks on this call tonight, it just really opened my eyes to a lot of the things that are going on in your body, your brain, your heart, diabetes, I mean, some hypertension strokes. There's, there's a lot of serious things where, oh, I just thought I was just going to be more tired and I just have to will my way through it. There's a lot more to it than just that, obviously. So, but uh, really, really appreciate it. And then this recording will be hopefully posted probably sometime uh, tomorrow or maybe the next day on our Facebook WS Coaching Group site for anybody else that couldn't make the call that still wants information about sleep and such. Sound good? Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Appreciate thank your participation. You.